My name is Susan Hailman, and I'll be facilitating the session today. Um, I work with Campaign Consultation, and this um, e seminar is sponsored by VISTA this afternoon. Um, we're a provider for the Corporation for National and Community Service. Um, VISTA has graciously um, opened the seminar to all the students of service of the corporation, so you're all welcome to participate. Um, and we're very glad to have a good turnout for this uh, first e-seminar of the series. Um, what we hope to do with these seminars is to open questions that are a little bit broader than the usual webinar topic. What we hope will happen is we'll have about a half an hour of presentation and then a half an hour of discussion among you, not just questions and answers with the presenters, but discussion among you. because. The topics don't have easy answers. The topics we're choosing are ones that are, are pretty big, and there are probably a lot of ways to use the information that we're going to be covering this afternoon. And we hope that we'll hear some ideas from each of you that we haven't heard before, and that will enlighten all of us as we work through some of these difficult questions and difficult times for all of our programs. Um, the first topic, as you know, is small gifts and microloans. And um, we chose that because these are hard times and people are going to have to be very creative in trying to figure out how to find resources for their programs. And these are some of the ways that are being pro proffered in, in the literature on sustainability that can build a different kind of basis for funding than foundations and government grants, which we know in many cases are shrinking. To start us off, our speakers for this session are Melissa Klein. Melissa is a Spanish teacher with KIPP DC Key Academy. And she'll be talking about her experience with Donors Choose. Um, Gina Takahashi, who's with Donors Choose. Stacey Monk, who's with Epic Change. And our agenda for today is that we'll hear from our, our recipient first and hear about her experience. We know that, um, in general, um, we've all been in trying to do good in under-resourced communities in the position where we have a project underway and there just aren't the resources we would hope for to get it um, off, off go. And so uh, Melissa is one of the folks as a teacher who is in that situation and she's going to talk about her experience finding funding for a program that was important to her. Melissa. Yes. Um, Hi everyone, I'm so glad to be able to share my story with you. Um, I um, have actually applied to Donors Choose twice in the past. Uh, the first time I was actually unsuccessful with getting my project funded. Um, so I'm going to talk about the second time I applied and tell you some of the things I did the second time, what Donors Choose was looking for in my application, um, and hopefully that will help you in your, um, in your experiences. Um, uh, first of all, um, Donors Choose funds teachers through primarily through an essay. Um, where you explain your needs as a teacher um, and what they really are looking for, what the funders are looking for with donors to is, is very specific things. Um, they want the teachers to show exactly how they're going to be able to use those um, small donations to make an impact in their classroom. Um, so the second time I applied when I was successful, I made sure I was really careful about um, explaining why I needed the resources for my room. Um, I was applying as a Spanish teacher for a classroom library of Spanish books. Um, and I was really excited about having these books in my room, but they're very expensive and, um, and they can be hard to find. So that's why I, I turned to Donors Choose. My school was not able to um, have that kind of money. It was going to cost hundreds of dollars. Um, and so that was why I needed the resources. I wanted to provide that opportunity for my students. Um, but I think the big piece that Donors Choose looks for and their funders look for is um, why the resources are needed, but also why I can't get those in another fashion. Um, so I was very specific with them that second time I applied, um, explaining to them that although books are available obviously at public libraries and my school could purchase a few, the number that I needed to make this a successful um, classroom project and um, the, the quality of the books and the types that I wanted were simply not available to me otherwise. Um, and the other part that I think was so important in reaching out to the um, donors and convincing them that my project was useful was why my kids deserved the money and deserved those books in my classroom. Um, talking about how my students would be able to go to high school and college with, a, uh, with an advanced, um, advanced knowledge of Spanish. Um, 
because they would be able to see those words. And I knew in my classroom I'd heard them use vocabulary from those words in speaking, and I'd seen them write them in their um, in essays and on exams. And and there was just a way that they were learning language um, in a fun way, and I could never have really replicated that without those textbooks or without those books in my library. Um, and, uh, and finally, just making sure that the donors understood the lasting impact that um, that those books would have in my classroom. I wasn't asking for something to be used one time. I was asking for books that would stay in my classroom for forever um, and talking about how we would use them carefully and um, how my students were taught to use those materials appropriately so they'd be useful over a long period of time. Um, so once I included all of that in my essay and was able to really reach out to the, um, the donors and Donors Choose and, and convince them um, of the need in my classroom, I was about a, approximately a month later, um, I found out that a donor had chosen my, um, my project and had chosen to fund it. I received $250. Um, and the way Donors Choose works is the donor provides the money to Donors Choose. Donors Choose asks me um, for the specific books I was looking for. I was able to look at online real retailers. Um, and then Donors Choose works as the intermediary. Um, and I received those materials um, um, pretty quickly after that. We waited for the summer to be over, and I received them in the fall. Um, and the final piece that I think is really important um, and why Donors Choose is extremely successful is that once I received the materials, I was asked to write a thank you note and to have my students write letters of appreciation to the donor, who actually was anonymous to us. Um, but we packaged those materials along with some photographs of my students reading the books and some projects they had done related to the books, and we um, sent them to the donor. And I think all those pieces together um, keep, makes the donor feel like they've really made an impact, um, and it helps the students to be appreciative of what they received. Um, but all those pieces together made donors choose a really great experience for me and my students. Um, and I believe that it really makes the donors feel like they have a piece um, in what we're doing in my school. Thanks, Melissa. You're um, welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just, you're welcome. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we'll hear from Gina Takahashi. And Gina represents Donors Choose. Gina, tell us a little bit about, about Donors Choose and how it came about and how it functions in the big picture. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Gina Takahashi. Um, I work for Donors Choose. And thank you so much for joining the webinar. Um, I really wanted to speak to what Melissa said um, about citizen philanthropy, getting people really involved in projects. And so I wanted to give you a bit of a background um, about DonorsChoose.org. Um, it started in 2000, um, and it was started by Charles Best, who was our CEO and founder, and he was a social studies teacher in the Bronx. And he kind of fondly talks about his time when he was a teacher, and they would sit around the lunchroom and talk about how they really wanted to do the science project, but they didn't have the funds. Um, they really wanted to take their kids out to, um, out to a museum or out on a trip to Washington, D.C., but they really, the school didn't, couldn't provide the, for those funds for these special kinds of trips. And so you have a room full of really innovative teachers, really inspiring uh, people who really want to inspire their students to learn. And when those funds aren't available, um, it makes it really difficult. And so that's really how Donors Truth came about, um, and its mission is to improve public education by providing these teachers with the resources they need. Um, and I think we're all aware that right now in tough economic times, it's really with budget cuts, with people not donating as much to charities, um, with people with, uh, who have a little bit to give but don't feel like it is, it's enough to make a change, I do believe that Donors Truth tries to um, show those donors these potential donors who we call citizen philanthropists, that they really can make a change. Um, and so how it works, and Melissa um, spoke about this, is how um, teachers go on our website and post a project. Um, and the process has changed a little bit, but now you can shop for the exact items you'd like, and then you write an essay. Um, now it's kind of segmented into shorter pieces so that it's not as a daunting task, so it's not like you're applying a, you're writing a five-page essay, like a, um, applying for a grant. This is very simple steps um, saying how the materials are going to impact um, your students' learning, how they're going to be used to promote that. And then once it's funded on the website, then DonorsChoose.org um, purchases these materials, sends them to the schools, and then the key component is really the students using the materials, the teacher taking the pictures, and then asking the students to write letters of appreciation um, 
these thank you packages back to the donors to say thank you for these materials and really show how much of an impact a five dollar donation might have had on the classroom. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that most people on this call um, might would probably not be eligible um, directly for this funding because um, uh, we ask that teachers who are um, who work full time in the classroom I for um, uh, can register on the website. But we really encourage people to, if you're in a position to help um, direct these teachers um, towards uh, this method of receiving funding, we would love you to encourage them. Um, we would love you to help them write the essays if that's a um, process. We would love to see you um, kind of coming up with ideas, like really creative ideas that can be implemented in the classroom um, and then helping the teachers um, write that write their essay and quantify the impact um, online once they register on the website. And so this is, donorshoes.org is really open to public school teachers across the U.S. And when I talked a little bit about uh, posting a project on the website, as I said, it's not really a huge daunting task. It's really step by step. It's quite easy to follow. Um, and so I think that makes it a lot easier and, um, when we think about charitable giving and thinking about the methods we have to go through in order to acquire funding. It can be a little uh, tedious, but we hope that um, after quite a few iterations of uh, the submission process, we try to find a step by step way that makes it easier for any user um, to post a project on the website. And so really the first step is getting started. Um, we ask teachers to set up an account and then upload a photo of their classroom. Um, a lot of teachers put up pictures of their uh, kids in the classroom or an empty classroom where, um, to show that these are, this is a place that really needs the resources. Um, and then the second step is to go shopping online, um, picking out the um, items that you'd like, the resources that you'd like for your classroom. And so the point of this is that um, once you select these materials and it's posted on the website, a potential donor can come to your project page and look at exactly the resources that you're asking for. And so we find that, especially now when um, people really aren't willing or able to give a lot of money when they don't know exactly what it's going towards, by having all the information online um, showing exactly where the money is going, we find that uh, donors really trust um, putting their money towards a certain project. Even if it's $5, they know that that money is going to be put to good use. And so uh, the rest of the uh, project submission process is once you find your materials, you write your essay uh, describing your situation, describing the solution you came up with, whether it's an innovative solution um, to really inspire your students uh, to get engaged in learning. Um, and as Melissa said, being specific about how the how these resources are really going to make an impact on the classroom. And so another step is to quantify impact. And so we try to help teachers really quantify impact by saying how many hours of learning you're going to get out of it or if these resources are going to be used in the future. And so we believe that all these things help donors to give uh, help to give donors a good sense of exactly where their money is going. And then you just confirm your project. Um, and we review it to be put on the website. And so it's a six-step uh, process that we hope is very easy to follow. But then, of course, the most important part is getting those projects funded. Um, and as I just mentioned, we review all the projects that are posted on the website um, just so that we can make sure that teachers have all the tools they need to make sure that their uh, project is funded. Because right now we have about a 65% uh, project success rate um, for projects getting fully funded on the website. But um, this can really change with, uh, first of all, how much your project costs. We find that projects that are under $400, so a classroom set of uh, certain books, of encyclopedias, maybe that would be under $400, that is more likely to get funded than something that is in the thousands of dollars, obviously. Um, but another way that we find that teachers really are successful is spreading the word about their projects. Um, you're not asking someone to write a $200 check to your school um, where they don't know exactly where the money is going. You have a specific project on the website. You have a page to yourself saying, this is exactly what I need for my classroom. This is exactly how I'm going to use it. And so we see a lot of teachers with their email signatures saying, check out my project on donorshoes.org with a link to their project. And so really engaging your friends, your family, um, your colleagues, and your community to join in the effort to really get the materials you need to inspire your students. 
And finally, um, what Melissa has talked about is these thank you notes. Um, what we find is the most powerful tool to getting those small gifts getting, and getting people to really um, engage in citizen philanthropy is making that connection between the donor and the teacher much more powerful. And so we find that these thank you notes that the students write are really the most special thing that a donor can get to feel that their donation had an impact on a student on students' learning. And so I do think that this is something that is sort of specific to donorshoots.org, um, but can be applied in any sort of uh, giving experience. Really acknowledging your donors, even for a small amount, really, um, really engages them in the giving experience and can make them repeat donors. Um, they might come back to your project if you have another one up in two months um, to fund that same project that they were really inspired by the thank you notes that they received. And another thing that is on the website right now is a section where you can mute the donors. And so on the left hand side you see um, Melissa gave, uh, Melissa a donor gave to this project and said that she gave because this project really um, kind of inspired her because her son's favorite subject is math and thought the project was, was really cool and so the teacher can respond right away. And so making that instant connection that um, really uses, we're trying to use the internet as in the best way possible, making those instant connections online, we find that it really engages the community. And so, again, this is something that's open to anyone who donates to the page. Anyone who puts down a $1 donation can really talk to the teacher and really get a sense of how um, their funds are being used and how they're impacting education. And so in addition to these citizen philanthropists, um, we also provide funding opportunities. So um, what we do is we have, we've been really lucky to um, receive donations from large foundations such as the Gates Foundation and other uh, corporate partnerships across the U.S. Um, but what they do is they don't um, just funnel all of their money towards um, like a blanket cost. What they do is they provide, they still provide that giving experience for us and philanthropists through double your impact offers. And what that means is the foundation or the corporate uh, partner will put down the money for half of the project price. And as soon as the donor comes in to fund a part of that project, they match that person's donation. And so in this way, your $5 donation can become a $10, your $100 donation a $200 donation, and can possibly fully fund a project. And so that really, we found, it really inspires donors to, it really empowers them because um, right now maybe they don't feel like a $10 donation goes far, but um, fortunately, uh, thanks to these uh, very generous donors, they, their small gift or their small donation can still have a huge impact and potentially fully funded projects. Another funding opportunity is tipping point funding for teachers that have like 90% of their project uh, funded and just need that little um, push to get it fully funded so that they can get the materials. And so we have um, quite a few corporate partnerships and foundations that partner with us to make sure these giving experiences can happen. And you can find that on our website as well. And so finally, I just want to close with the impact that we've had um, thanks to individual donors who come to our website every day. And right now, we've had over $32 million donated, which means it's impacted over $2 million students across the U.S. And so it's really thanks to those donations that come in um, individually and then those foundations that can match those donations as well. And we find that what, what we learn from this is that no matter how small your donation, you can really have an impact and you can really become a citizen philanthropist. And really what the most important part of our model is the thank yous that the students send. And so acknowledging donors and creating that really, and creating a closer connection um, especially in these times when we, a lot of people really want to know exactly where their money is going. Not only do they see exactly where their money is going um, by looking at the resources that are being funded, they also see what impact um, their donation is having on the students. And I think that special connection, um, these students are really speaking from their heart when they say thank you with these drawings and with their pictures with, um, with the materials that are purchased. That's really the special connection that we really want to foster um, between the donor and the teacher. And so if you have any questions about donorshoots.org or um, anything about citizen philanthropy or um, e-philanthropy, which is something kind of that's cropping up, um, please feel free to contact me, uh, Gina at donorshoots.org. 
Hey, Gina, we have a question um, from Kathy, and she wanted to know if after-school programs are eligible if they're run by certified teachers. Yes, um, after-school programs are eligible as long as the teacher is a full-time teacher, um, and, and as long as the after-school program has um, has to do with student learning. If it's gonna, if the materials for that program are gonna enhance a student's, a student's learning experience, it is eligible for funding. Great, thank you. Thanks, Gina. Um, are there any other questions that we want to take care of right away? Remember, you have to unmute to ask a question. Okay, let's move on. Um, Stacy Monk is going to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to talk about microloans and, and a new program that she's operating that um, it takes a very different twist on microloans. And, and I think although as national service programs we're not generally involved in loans, I think there's a lot for us to learn from this. So I, I hope you'll be listening and we'll be ready to discuss it afterwards. Stacy. Great, thank you so much. Um, my name is Stacy Monk, and I'm the founder of a startup nonprofit called Epic Change. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit about how we've been able to use the power of small gifts to make a huge difference uh, for our prototype project in Tanzania. Um, so let me see. So at Epic Change, what we do is we help people who are already doing amazing things in their communities, people like I'm guessing most of the folks on this call, we help them share their stories in ways that raise the resources that they need to improve their own communities. Um, the first thing we do is we raise money, and we really focus on small gifts uh, from individuals to provide loan capital. So we actually make loans. We don't do um, grants. Uh, so we're different from donors choose in that way. Uh, then we make a change. So we make substantive loans. So most micro loans, if you've heard of like Kiva, uh, those are in the realm of like $500 to $1,000. We actually do, our, our prototype loan is $65,000 currently in Arusha, Tanzania, and it will actually be more substantive than that. Um, but we try to make loans that can make a very significant difference uh, for the change makers that we're working with, and I'll share a little bit more about that specifically. Uh, the third thing we do is then we, because the changes that we're supporting are nonprofit, uh, we support them in creating income streams uh, to pay back that loan. Uh, and the way that we do that is by sharing their stories and, and creating products that are marketed with those stories. So I'll share specific examples as we move through. And then finally, once the loan is paid back, the aim is to pay that forward so that someone who created change in their own community not only did it in their community, but then gets to participate in choosing where that loan goes next. Um, and as I mentioned, our first loan is in Tanzania, so the woman who received that loan will be able to not only make change in her community there in Arusha, but also participate in making change potentially uh, in the States or in Latin America or somewhere else on the globe. Um, so I love this quote, um, nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could do only little. Uh, and the woman on the slide here, her name is Mama Lucy Camtoni, she's actually the recipient of our first prototype loan in Tanzania. Uh, she used to sell chickens and she saved up her income and she rented a tiny piece of land next door to her house and she started a little school with six students. And by the time I had met her, there were 115 students there. Uh, she was paying teachers. She was charging tuition to the students who could afford to pay to subsidize the orphans and the other children who couldn't. Um, and I think she just makes a tremendous point. When you give uh, what you're able, you, you can potentially make a huge difference. And the reason we chose to get involved in her particular story was because she was doing tremendous good, but she didn't have access to the resources she needed to make an even bigger difference in her community. Um, and we started actually by looking for uh, just partnering with her before Epic Change was ever founded, we tried to approach other granting organizations and present her uh, grant uh, application because we thought foundations, yeah, they have a lot of money and businesses have a lot of money, so maybe we can get it from them. Well, what we learned is actually individuals are the key to giving. Um, actually, according to Giving USA, uh, Individuals are the engine of the charitable sector. They make up like 75% of all giving in 2007. Um, and in our country, uh, about two-thirds of households with incomes under under $100,000 give to charity. Um, a lot of people in America actually give to charity. And 
Well, we thought uh, it was actually the wealthy uh, that were the primary givers. It's actually, as a percentage of salary, it's actually the working poor who give more than anyone in our country. So we really started on a strategy of figuring out how do we uh, get to those small gifts. And um, I'll share with you just quickly uh, how we moved from small gifts to significant outcomes. Um, we're a volunteer-run startup. We pay no salaries. Uh, so we've been in existence for about 18 months, and we've raised about $75,000. Um, over 80% of, of our donors have given $40 or less. Um, so you can see how much of a difference uh, just a $40 gift can make. It just doesn't did for, uh, for donors choose. Um, and epic outcomes. So since uh, December of 07, we made our first loan. We've loaned over $65,000 in Arusha. Uh, with that money, land has been purchased, five new classrooms have been built, and a school bus. Um, so those are the tangible assets. But more importantly, there are now over 300 children at the school. And the school, because of our investment, was able to qualify to participate in national exams. And the very first time they participated, they scored number one out of 117 schools in their district, including other schools that are foreign funded and may have millions of, do of dollars in funding. So this little, tiny, locally led, locally founded school performed at the top of its district. And we were really excited about those outcomes. And uh, it just kind of proved our hypothesis that local change makers can make a huge difference if they have the access to the resources they need to, to make change. Um, We've actually helped her to repay over 15% of that initial uh, $35,000 loan, too, because we've sold things like you'll see a candle here. Um, we've basically wrapped products with hopeful stories. And um, I think we've seen from like the Obama campaign and other places recently that hope is really a great strategy. So uh, we've really been leveraging the hope in her community to, to, to sell things to help her repay back that loan. And our work has appeared in over 200 um, online publications, from the Nonprofit Times to Ode, Mashable, Venture Beat. Um, a lot of people have been picking up on what we're doing. Um, I just want to give you one example of how we compel those, um, those small gifts. Uh, we do a lot with social networking and online community building um, because it's free. <laughs> so um, one of the events we scheduled was called Tweets Giving. Uh, it was created in November 2008. And we used Twitter to celebrate gratitude and giving, and in 48 hours, we raised over $11,000. Um, just to give you some uh, idea of how much investment that took versus how much it raised, it was prepared in six days. I actually had the, the idea six days before we went live. Uh, it was done by five part-time volunteers, uh, people that I just reached out to. We spent $10 on the domain registration. Um, and we used entirely free and, uh, in the case of PayPal, low-cost tools. Um, Twitter, we used Chipin, which is totally free. We used YouTube, uh, a WordPress blog, and PayPal. Um, like I said, we raised over $11,000 in 48 hours. There were 360 donors to the project, and 98% of those were people who had never heard of Epic Change before. Um, 30, uh, our average gift was $30.92. We had over 15,000 visitors to that website uh, in 48 hours. There were over 3,000 people who sent out tweets of gratitude tagged with our uh, tagline. And uh, it built a new classroom. And you could see that, actually, on the previous slide. Um, it says in the background, this classroom built by gratitude. And those are actually the Twitter handle names of all of the donors. So we were able to send out to all of our donors, similar to uh, how Donors Choose does thank you notes, um, we were able to send out a personalized uh, note that had their name actually painted on the wall where the students were learning. Um, so I would encourage you, as people who are leading in your communities, to start to build a small gift strategy. And I'll just share a couple of lessons that we've learned and, and some things from Beth Cantor, um, who is one of the most prolific, uh, brilliant bloggers about social media and social change. Um, Micro-collaboration is the process by which many people uh, work together in lots of little ways to create something bigger than we could alone. Um, so that's really the strategy that we've relied on. And there's five ways we really think um, that you can help to build yourself a micro-collaborative network. Uh, the first one is share yourself. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these on each slide, but really be authentic. Um, uh, people are much more interested in giving if they know why you care. 
Uh, two is share stories, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, three is spread hope. Four is creating community with relationship building, rewards, reciprocity, and fun. Uh, and five is using free tools and existing communities to build your own community. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. The first one is um, being your authentic self and sharing yourself. Um, the message isn't necessarily about the charity. It's about why the messenger cares. Um, so in this case, if you look at these, that's actually me, I'm the only white girl on the slide. <laughs> um, but I care. I, Mama Lucy and Beatrice are in the larger picture. Alice is in the smaller picture than Faith and Gideon and Edmund and Pius and uh, Naomi and Babu and Glory and all of these people. I know their stories intimately and I know this community. So I've been able to share with our donors and potential donors why their story is really so compelling to me. Why this woman in the middle of Arusha who used to sell chickens and had such incredibly audacious hope that she was willing to kind of put it all on the line and go build a school, why that's so compelling. Uh, the second thing is um, sharing stories. Um, a lot of people who come from a policy background, I actually went to a policy school for grad school, um, have the tendency to want to share stats and share big numbers. Actually, um, sharing stories, the, sh the story of just one person, um, is actually far more inspirational of giving than sharing information about an entire community. So I would encourage you to share vivid stories and also to narrow the frame. So instead of talking about how you can affect an entire population if you donate. Talk about how you can affect just one person. In the case of Donors Choose, it's one teacher, one classroom. Um, and in our case, we talk a lot about um, just one child that's impacted at the school or one or Mama Lucy, the founder of the school. Um, uh, we cannot wrap our minds around two people as, as well as we can just once. So narrow the frame. Um, the next lesson is spread hope, and I think we've seen from the success of the Obama campaign to the way that Pepsi and other large corporations are entirely reorient reorienting their brands around hope, um, that that's really a successful strategy. And guess what? Nonprofits and our kinds of efforts, if we have nothing else, we have hope to sell. So um, I think historically a lot of nonprofits have used fear and guilt as motivators. I actually believe that hope is a much more powerful strategy. There's a, a great quote here from Seth Godin, who's a really reputable uh, marketer um, and author, um, and you can refer to it later. Um, then build a community, and I think we all know how to do this. The only way to have a friend is to be a friend. So build relationships, and you can do that online, you can do that in person. For me, I live in a tiny community in Florida, so I've really reached out online. Um, I built relationships on Twitter for several months before I ever even thought of imagining tweets giving. Um, Mama Lucy blogs in our community, as do um, parents from the school. So we try to build as much of a bridge directly to the community of impact as we possibly can between our donors and the community of impact. Um, we've shared YouTube videos. We've actually had people dedicate songs from here to there. Um, we've shared artwork between donors and the children of Tanzania. Uh, the second thing is rewards. People always love to work for rewards. So during Tweets Giving, for example, if you gave $100, you were one of our top turkeys, and we posted you on our first page, our top page, and uh, we kept retweeting your name. Uh, I showed you that the Twitter handles were painted on the walls in Arusha. There was a YouTube thank you video that we did that had a thank you uh, note to different donors. And reciprocity, don't forget that you can't always, in online communities, you can't always be talking about yourself. Um, you really have to invest in the lives of other people. Just like I said, the only way to have a friend is to be a friend. Uh, and then don't forget the F word, fun. No one wants to join a boring community. Um, some of the uh, things we deal with are really serious, but there are uh, ways to really engage people in fun and interesting ways. And then on the last page here, I just wanted to share um, where a new invention promises to be useful, it ought to be tried. So there's all of these tools, and there's a tool set there. Um, all of, most all of them are free. Uh, so figure out how to use them and put and make use of them. Uh, I've, I've put a list of blogs and tool sets that I really refer to uh, as I create social media campaigns and things like that. Um, and I hope they'll be helpful to you. The first one is Beth's blog. If you're not reading Beth's blog uh, and you really want to use social media, she's the prime resource. Um, and then the other one I'll point out to you is We Are Media. Uh, and that's a wiki that's being developed uh, with 
how to use all different tool sets from YouTube to Twitter to Facebook and things like that. And most of these are free, so um, no excuses. And then I just wanted to say again, small gifts can create epic change. Imagine this woman who used to just sell chickens and started with, from scratch. Uh, now she's got a school that the number one school in her district that serves over 300 children and is just growing day after day. Um, so that's, that's, I think, how I'll wrap up. Um, if you have any questions for me, the fastest way to get to me is uh, at Stacey Monk on Twitter. Um, you can certainly send me an email, and you can visit our website. Thank you, Stacy. That was great. Does anybody have any questions right away for, for Stacy? Remember, you have to unmute. Okay. Let's move on to some discussion. And I'm really looking to everybody who's participating now to get involved because this is hopefully where the richness is beyond the wonderful presentations. But how do you use it? Is there are a million different ways that you could take little bits of this, I hope, and use it. But we won't grow from that unless we share it. So let's start with, in your opinion, what makes the direct giving sites like Donors Choose so appealing to requesters and to donors? Um, this is uh, Brandon. Um, I, I believe that mainly I think one of the best ways is that um, with the cards and everything and just the direct relationship and the pictures, the donor can really have a hand and really see what they've done. I mean, so often, um, you know, people who give to charities or give to a large something like Habitat for Humanity, and they'll never really get to see the result. So uh, I, I, I believe seeing the result is probably a great motivating factor. Do any of you have examples of ways that your programs currently make a strong relationship between that donor and, and, the, and the service that they're helping to support? I do. Um, oh, this is ahead. Trish. Um, Trish Perkins in Greensboro, North Carolina. But we have a weekly e-newsletter that goes out. And we try to make an effort in every e-newsletter to tell one story about one of the immigrants or refugees that we have helped or that has volunteered with us or that has donated to us so that um, everybody, each part of the relationship gets featured as a story on our newsletter every week. There's some kind of story about somebody who has a relationship with us. Great, good example. Anybody else? Um, Kara from the University of Louisville. Um, we just did a, we actually just had our alternative spring break um, this past month in, in March. And um, pretty much all of our money either came from the students or we had several staff and faculty members of the university that donated things. And um, the students sent them pictures and posted a blog to keep them updated on what was going on and also wrote them thank you co uh, notes for everything that they donated. Great, great. So there was a, a thank you note at, that linked what was actually done during the spring break with those donations. Yes. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Well, I actually had a question. I think it's Stacy. She's the one who did um, the epic change. Is that right? Yes. Um, I'm just interested, when you talked about reciprocity, um, you kind of went fast over that. And I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. So I'd really appreciate it if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Absolutely. So I participate a lot, especially in the Twitter community, um, but also in communities like Facebook and in other places online. I, while I do a lot of uh, promotion and a lot of talking about the work we do at Epic Change, I also, I'm constantly retweeting, for instance, the messages of other people and sharing um, the work that other people in my network are doing. Uh, occasionally I'll post blogs that are cross-referencing other people to drive traffic to their blogs. There's all different kinds of ways. I donate small donations to other people's causes when they're doing uh, important micro-fundraising micro efforts. It's really just about 
how can you, uh, how, and it doesn't have to be monetary, but how can you use your voice in support of other people? Because uh, I, I find that in online communities, if you're constantly talking about yourself, if that's, if that's the only message, the fewer people who are going to follow you. You really have to uh, be supportive and be engaged with other people's work as well, if you want them to, to be engaged and supportive of yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think we can borrow from that direct giving approach? We've heard that there are folks that are really doing a, real, a good job of linking the small gifts with the, um, the impact they're having. And we've heard that people are copying the idea of thank you notes and um, here donor, here's exactly where your money went and the good that it did. What else can we borrow from this direct giving approach? What did you hear that you might be able to pick up on? Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to think about. <laughs> well, I think the, the idea of using um, all those different wonderful um, internet tools. I, I do technology for Faith Action, the organization I work for, um, and we, we spent today sort of trying to think about how we could use Twitter in a campaign that we're just starting. But I, I think this whole idea of trying to use as many of those different tools that are free, that are out there, like Chip In, um, like um, WordPress, all of those, I think that's a really um, important, that can make a very important impact. I think there is a question, however, as to how much time those kind of things take. And I'm, I'm interested, um, Stacey, in how much time you spend doing this kind of thing. Um, it's interesting. It really differs by person. And there's actually on uh, Beth Cantor's blog, there is a, um, there's a really nice article that she's posted about about different levels of time and investment that you can make in those kinds of things. Because we have really chosen to become and evolve into a really social media-based organization, I would say up to 50% of my time is spent uh, either in development of our online site, our blog, um, nurturing our Twitter community, working with our Facebook community. Um, and remember, we are in the startup phases, so we're really kind of building, uh, building that community. So I think, I, you know, I, I would say that I would be dishonest if I would say it was less than half of my time. I, I definitely think it is a very, very time-intensive process. But I also think it's very, very um, rewarding because it's not as if I'm only getting the funds, which, you know, in comparison to much larger organizations or more established organizations may not be as significant. Um, but like I said, everything we do is volunteer run from our website to um, the entire Tweets Giving campaign that was pulled together in six days. All of that comes from the relationships that I'm able to build online. So, um, so I would say, yeah, it's about half of my time at this point. You know, while that's a huge percentage, I, the other thing that, that is coming to my mind as I'm listening is how many of your donors, and, and I'm going to address this first to Gina and then to Stacey, how many of your donors are repeat donors? You know, so how much of this, you know, would you, if you were looking at more traditional um, um, stakeholder development or, or um, cultivation of donors, is, is with people that have already given, have a record of giving, and give again. Do you, know, do you have an idea of how, what percentage of your folks give again? Um, Gina, are you on mute? Pound six. Hello? Ah, there we are. Okay, sorry. Um, I was just saying, I don't have a specific percentage. Um, it, I guess it really depends on the campaigns. Um, right now, I think it is about uh, just a little less than half. Uh -huh. um, and it really is a lot of people who, are, who already have relationships with their um, with their the teachers on the website, whether it's their friends or colleagues, um, who are our repeat donors. But um, then again, we have a lot of people who come across the site through these blogs and through these uh, messages, social media that um, Stacey was talking about, 
mm-hmm. who might come and give a, um, a little bit of money, and then if they don't, um, it really depends on the thank you package they get usually. Um, and if they get a really compelling thank you package, they're back in um, donating more next. But right now, it's, I think it's about 50%. That's great. Thank you. Stacy, do you have a sense of that yet? You're really new in the process. 18 months, you may not be sure yet, but do you have a sense? Right. I don't think we're sure yet. We certainly have um, donors that give month to month. Uh-huh. Um, so uh, I'm not sure uh, how many that that is. But, um, but yeah, I think... It's interesting. There have been recent studies, uh, one published, I believe, in the New York Times, about online givers not actually coming back. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion recently as to whether we've had enough data to really prove whether uh, whether that's the case. Um, I would say that we have a lot of very, very engaged online givers. Uh, so I, I would be surprised if they don't give again when we do uh, major campaigns. Thanks. Are there other things that you heard that we can borrow from this approach? I think the idea of the social media, which is free and which creates that online um, relationship is certainly a big one. What about telling stories? Are any of you really engaged in figuring out how you tell your stories and how you make that impact? Could you repeat that question? I was busy unmuting myself, and so I, I couldn't okay. hear you. Um, I, I guess I'm curious about um, how many of you really are, cost, are are continuously involved in refining your stories so that they are, as, as, as both Stacey and Gina and Melissa point out, the more clearly you can say what the impact of this dollar is going to be and who's going to benefit the better your chance of really reaching out and hooking that donor. And I wonder to what extent at that and, and working on that process. Please unmute if you want to talk. How and six. Let's ask another question. Yeah. So we know that microloans have been getting a lot of attention. What do you think in the U.S. we can learn from programs like Epic Change? I can't. If there's somebody speaking, you need to speak up. We can barely hear you. Please unmute if you want to speak. Mm-hmm. So, big silence. Does that mean that microloans aren't really something that you think has applicability for your program? Well, actually, can you hear me? Yes, now yes. I can. Okay, hi, this is Amy Falcon, and for, and um, I can see where that's a possibility. Um, we're kind of in a different situation because we're an indirect service organization. We support nonprofits who are doing the direct service, and with resources and grant counseling and volunteers, but we do fiscal agent work. So we're helping a lot of groups just get started. And we're looking at this idea um, as a way to help uh, provide a seed money fund for nonprofits that need, groups that are just trying to raise the money to get their 501c3 filing fees complete. And I could see where something like this might work for for that project. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like that sounds like a possibility. And and. If you're not in the business of microloans, what other aspects of what Stacy was talking about are really applicable to your program? How can you know, that approach? Very hands-on, very direct. Let me look you in the eye over the over the internet <laughs> and tell you the story. What can we pull from that? I'm 
Yes. I can't tell if somebody is trying to talk. I'm hearing computer typing, but I'm I'm wondering if somebody's also trying to talk. I'm not seeing questions. Maybe somebody was in where they weren't needed. But the the issue of microloans as far as faith action is concerned is that you still have to have um, revenue streams to pay back a microloan. This is Stacy, absolutely. So what we do is support um, support our partners in creating those income streams. So uh, she's managed to raise thousands of dollars, which in that community is just an unheard of amount of money um, in a very short time. Um, we've done things from uh, reaching out to small businesses in the United States that were uh, manufacturing items like cards and gifts and candles um, and uh, wrapping her story around those. There's a compelling studies that say that uh, sales will increase uh, if a good is sold for good. Um, so there are small businesses and other um, organizations that want to associate their products with good but may not have uh, identified somebody who can tell their story in a really compelling way or who are, are able to provide images and, um, and, and great uh, story content to really bolster sales of other items. So that's one thing um, that we have done. She's also done performances. Uh, we had the children. We taught the children how to use. We had brought a photographer over there and taught them photography. They created postcards that are now sold in local hotels in Arusha. So there's all sorts of things you can do to help create those kinds of income streams to pay back those loans. The items that she's selling, is she selling them there or is she selling them here? We and if she's selling them here, how are you selling them? Uh, we do both. Uh, she's actually arranged some hotel sales over there. And we do online sales, and we actually just got into our first retail place in California. Um, so, but mostly online. We use a, pr a tool called Shopify, um, which is very, very inexpensive, um, and we drive our sales through there. Advertising from your website. Yeah. But because most of our community is built in the social media space, they're very, very savvy about uh, how to access that. Mm -hmm. And again, you have to adapt the things to your communities, I would think. You know, there are communities where your most likely givers may need to may need to see some of these products, you know, at, at things like community art fairs or right. those community gift shops, those kinds of things to start out with. And you may be able to also lead them to websites to buy them after that. But you may your first your first uh um, attempts may need to be with the with the real product in a real space if that's what your community is used to. It's it's slow build. I mean, I I wouldn't think it would be instantaneous, but but you know, it's something to think about. Are there other applications of this that you can see for your programs, or other things that you might want to? Think about discussing offline when when our when our seminar is over. Well, this is Amy again, and one thing I'd like to know more about is uh, because we're in this indirect, we don't our stories are going to be a little bit different, and I'm would and and I'm, we're kind of struggling with how to how to make personal stories and inspire donors when it's for, you know, we help start this, you know, support our organization, you know, so, so support the cause of supporting these groups. Uh, one of our groups is, uh, works as a grief support, works with children in grief and suicide prevention. And everybody wants to donate to them, and that's wonderful. And we help launch their program, so we're trying to figure out how we're trying to figure out how to create that that heartstring story when it's 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 important, but it's removed. And 
I suppose one thing to do is to get the stories of the, you know, well, without Sierra, you know, it would have been a lot harder without Sierra nonprofits' help to get our 501c3 together. We didn't know how to do it. We did something like that. But does anybody have any suggestions of how we could hold, get some of those warm stories in a situation like ours? How we could create that? Well, this is Stacy, and and I would say that the out, the majority of the outcomes that we indirectly create are created by our loan recipient, Mama Lucy, in Arusha. Uh, we focus on her story a lot, though, uh, regardless of the fact that there is that kind of fiscal relief. We're a fiscal uh, relationship. We're not. We don't do the programs there. We don't do anything with the curriculum or the school or any of that. Those are outcomes that she creates, um, and we we specify as much as possible in all our blog writing and all of those things. That this is her place, and that she's able to do those things on, only because of the relationship that she was able to, the financial relationship that we were able to establish with her. Um, so I think you can, at least in our experience, it's been very successful for us to. Um, share that story as it um, as it kind of relates to us. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see that, and and that's the kind of the trick because um, every every people would definitely want to donate to that because they see us as you know they're donating to 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 her. They're donating for her, um, and. You know, and 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 so she's getting the benefit of that, isn't that right? Yes. Right. And what we need to do is make the case that um, donating to our organization is a benefit because it helps these other organizations keep go. You know, it helps provide a resource center for these other organizations. But it's not really ben it's it's benefiting to them because it helps keep our doors open which gives them a place to go find things like how to do fundraising and how to find a grant and where, where you know, and, and stuff like that. But it's not benefiting a direct service organization directly. Right. Technology has exactly the same problem. Yeah. yeah. I have, I have a, a nonprofit organization that is international, and we provide technology solutions to places around the world. Well, they are interesting. The stuff that they're doing is interesting, but getting somebody to give to us so that we can then turn around and help them. The money is not going to go to them. The money comes to us. That's what you're saying. In other yeah. words, it, yeah. it, it, it's nice that you're in business because they can come to you, but they're not going to turn around and get the money like Mama gets the money. Exactly. Mama gets the money, but in our situation, right. uh, yeah. Well, That's she does and she does. The donation is actually the epic change, and we aggregate the donations and loan it. So she actually has to pay it back. So, yes, it does in some – so it, in some ways it's the same kind of relationship where you're giving them – maybe it's not cash directly, but it is a good or service that's equivalent to that amount of cash. So I, I wouldn't short sell the impact that you're creating in that community. Um, I, I, I wouldn't overemphasize the fact that – we just do the technology piece because without the technology piece, that work cannot happen. Or you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's true; they wouldn't be able to get to her otherwise. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. So essentially, what they're donating to is the bank, and that's you. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And the money will come back to us. Epic change to reloan again. Um, so it's not as if the donor gets it back, and it's not as if Mama Lucy gets to keep it. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, I, th I can hear wheels turning from this distance. Is yeah. there more that we want to talk about this afternoon? I think I want to uh, open up the opportunity to continue the discussion when the seminar is over. Um, and I um, want to uh, let you know how we're going to be doing that. Uh, but first, I also want to make sure you know that this is the first in a series of webinars, and the next one will be on May 27th from 3 to 4, and it's on strategic thinking for idealists. How you can look at what you want to do, need to do, and plan for it, 
and figure out is there any way those stimulus dollars could come to you? Uh, <laughs> the question right now, isn't it? All over the country, I think cities and states and communities are looking at that. For the e seminar in July, we're going to try something new. We're going to try you propose, we plan. We're going to take your suggestions um, and for the July seminar and date in here isn't, let's see, isn't correct. We've got until about May 15th and we'll ask you to submit your ideas to us directly at campaign consultation and uh, we will set up a way to poll so that people can vote on what they want for the topic for the July e-seminar. We thought we'd get this out sooner and we thought we'd get suggestions sooner, but we're behind, what can I say? So up until May 15th, if you have ideas of topics you'd like to see covered in this, in this series, please let us know. We'll put them up for a vote and we'll let you know by the beginning of June what the topic for July will be. Once we get to August, we're going to do poverty perspectives. We're going to do a webinar on financial literacy and wealth building, and we're going to do a second in September on poverty, health status, nutrition, and environment. So um, we welcome your thoughts about those topics. We hope you'll register for them. Um, for continued discussion, Steph, you want to help me out here? Sure. Um, we opened up a discussion board on Vista Campus. Um, you can follow the link below, um, and that will take you directly to the forum. Um, if you're not going directly to the link, you can go under capacity, and it's under uh, funding and resources, uh, resources, and it has our title for uh, small gifts and micro loans, uh, e-seminar number one. And if you're from other programs, you might want to consider setting up a forum to talk about it on your listserv or on your discussion board. And we hope that you will do that. We will be watching those and we will be commenting on them. You can also get back directly to speakers um, directly from their email or their phone. And as they both said, I think their email is the easiest way to get them. So I um, hope you will do that. And we also have resources that we hope you downloaded. Yes. Um, you have the option to download it when you signed on. And when you close out of the program, it'll give you the option to download them, in which case you can download the PowerPoint. And also we made a research packet with some websites and interesting articles that might just spark your interest in another way. If for some reason you can't download it, I put my email in the chat box. It's grocott, G-R-O-C-O-T-T, -T, at campaignconsultation.com, and I'll be sure to send them to you. And we like your feedback on this e-seminar, so there is a, a survey and that will appear on the screen. We ask you to please complete it before you sign off. And thank you so much. We've enjoyed this. We enjoyed the discussion. Thank you for being part of it. Thank you to our presenters, Melissa and Gina and Stacy. You were um, just a font of information and good ideas, and we really